So welcome to today's Postgres conference webinar, the NoSQL store everyone ignored. We're joined by Zoheb Sitehassan, Senior Engineering Manager at DoorDash, who will do a walkthrough of the history of HStore and how we can now use JSONB support and Postgres and discuss what makes it enticing and comparable to NoSQL stores like MongoDB or CouchDB. My name is Lindsay Hooper. I'm one of the Postgres conference organizers and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. A little about your speaker. Zoheb is a dreamer, hacker, philosopher, troublemaker, I wanna know more about that one, and evangelist of open source, who is also a long-term Postgres believer. Today, he's a technical lead at DoorDash, leading the platform services team and using Postgres pretty heavily. Welcome. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off. Take it away. Thank you for the introduction, Lindsay. I, it was better than I expected. <laughs> um, so um, hello, everyone. Welcome to this session. Uh, this is a fun little talk that I enjoy talking to people a lot about because I think uh, fundamentally this whole feature set uh, for Postgres has been kind of ignored over the time. And we've been looking at you know shiny tools around. It is definitely something uh, that I believe uh, is worth looking into and might be useful uh, for your knowledge set. Uh, <clears throat> so first, a, a little bit about me. Uh, I think uh, I've been already given a big enough introduction, so I won't haggle here too much. Uh, here's my Twitter handle. You, you can follow me. I, 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 I tweet um, tech stuff and you know um, the, the troublemaker stuff that, that was pointed out. Uh, right now, I'm working at DoorDash. Um, uh, at DoorDash, um, we we I, I have to say we we use Postgres pretty heavily. Um, it has been our go-to tool. Uh, I've used I my I myself have been a convertee from uh, MySQL to Postgres uh, because for the longest time, like I was like a Lamp stack guy who was using PHP and you know MySQL and all that. But um, it, it really opened my eyes the moment I kind of started looking into the feature set and the data types, and I was like this is amazing like why are not people using it uh, and and you can kind of see on google trends it's pretty similar like the, the popularity of postgres has gone up quite a lot um so <clears throat> regarding this topic um let's let me give you a little bit of history of um how far back i go with this particular topic so in 2009 our friend pete published this blog post where uh, how FriendFeed uses MySQL to store schemaless data. You know, I was, again, going back to the context, I was the MySQL guy, I had to read this. Um, two years down the line, when, when I started investigating into various things, I figured out, it was one of the projects, if I remember correctly, where I had to store some schemaless stuff. Uh, I discovered Postgres in that, along with this whole thing I discovered, it store. Um, uh, I obviously blogged about it, uh, that here is my post from December 2011, where I first time covered the key value store everyone ignored, and this is exactly to, hence the title of the talk. You know, um, I'm kind of continuing on that, uh, you know, marching on this whole topic. Um, in 2012, uh, I kind of did a uh, reimagination of what a friend feed did what it was trying to do with MySQL and their, the limitations and all the all the stuff. I'll, I'll go to the details of this, so I won't you know spend more time over here, but I kind of reimagined the whole thing in 2012. And uh, by that time, obviously, I had tried Postgres with a store and you know deployed it in production and tried it out and it worked out pretty well for me. <clears throat> sort of continuing on that in 2015, so after that point, for the longest time, I was disconnected because I didn't I didn't have the same need or the same problem that I wanted to use it for again. But uh, way down in the line, when I look back in 2015, somebody did uh, talk with uh, same title in Dublin. Um, uh, I don't want to butcher the not last name, which is by Stefan. So uh, you can go check it out. Uh, it, it 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 has some good material in there. <clears throat> So for our roadmap today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a brief look at the friend feed use case with uh, warming up on its door and the history. Um, 
essentially when I would do that store thing, you would see I have essentially solved the problem that friend Pete was trying to solve with uh, the amount of code and the complexity that they had, that they had to deal with. Um, but then I would take it to, you know, uh, a higher level with JSONB, which is the modern incarnation of uh, storing uh, semi-structured or schemaless uh, data uh, in Postgres and uh, give, give you some examples of complex um, queries and how we would partition our documents uh, because Postgres now has, you know, built-in partition. So uh, basically it's, I'm going to show you how this is not just, you know, a side feature, but it is essentially the core and how you can marry it with other features of Postgres um, and, you know, do some pretty amazing and awesome stuff. So Postgres is always evolving, like um, at least for my 10 years, 12 years that I've been looking at Postgres, um, the, the, the whole storage engine, data wrappers, partitions, you know, different data types, that was the first thing that brought me into Postgres itself. So from robust schema less types from array, in store, XML, JSON, and JSON B to you know the core support on saying, hey, here's part how you can do partitions. Here, here's improved uh, data wrappers and storage engines. Postgres has just you know uh, evolved over time, and uh, th that's going to be the story going forward. So two years from now or three years from now, if you're looking at this talk, keep in mind things might have changed because it's it's always evolving and it's always getting better. So let's do a brief history of HStore uh, because I think uh, I want to do this because I think it's important to understand the the story or the timeline in this whole uh, universe of um, improvements that Postgres has brought to the table. So uh, May two thousand three, uh, first version of HStore. Um, that it was committed in and you know that was i think the movement where it was conceived um so if, if you want to look at the timeline of its store it was first committed or it got in for postgres android 3 it was unpublished um 2006 its, it's store was part of postgres 8.2 um the 2007 uh generalized inverted indexes and you know just support uh, Postgres 8.3, improvements in Postgres 9, and uh, in 2013, uh, somebody did some nested, uh, some work for nested it store with the race port, uh, so essentially enabling the document or the schema-free document store support. Let's stay tuned for this because I'm going to talk about this later on. This almost became it store 2 and uh, how it, uh, kind of, it kind of merged into JSONB, just to give it a spoiler. Um, Benefits of HStore, it provides you a flexible model for storing a semi-structured data in Postgres. Um, it is binary presented, so extremely fast. Selecting fields or properties is really quick. Um, uh, it supports uh, the JIN and GIST indices. Uh, the only drawback um, that I can point out here is it's just too flat for my taste, I would say, uh, because it's it's basically a key value store. It doesn't support nesting or tree structures uh, as you can think of in JSON. Uh, and JSON was introduced in 2006, three years later after the store. Um, so uh, how does it work? What's the data type? Um, we're, let's, let's, let's kind of uh, start some building some context for that. So enough theory, let's build something serious. Let's take the same friend feed example uh, using SQL to build NoSQL. So first I'm gonna give you a walkthrough of um, uh, what's up, what was the problem? How was it done uh, when friend feed did it? It's kind of, for, uh, it's kind of an, a brief summary. I won't be going pretty deep, but I would kind of show you the code patterns and all that. Uh, I would still recommend going to the original blog post here and go read through it. It's, it's, um, it was a mind opener for me, at least, I would say. Back in the days, it was a mind opener for me. So why friend feed? Um, uh, because it's a good example for understanding available technology and problem at hand. Uh, and uh, I want to emphasize this, uh, that uh, 
people kind of cave into buzzwords when they're selecting stores or something uh, new for you know solving a new kind of problem, which they think is oh, it's a brilliant idea. Well, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Um, I I I feel like a good engineering um, pick any big company. Uh, they 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 don't master on creating new technology right away. The first master on solving the problem with the tools that they really understand because then you can focus on solving the problem and later on they can improve tools like uh, i can throw out some examples like uh, facebook's php and hip-hop vm and all that uh, so don't cave into buzzwords that's my essential message same same is true here friendly didn't cave into the buzzwords and they started uh, using and you know didn't start using less reliable or you know, new tools, new kid on the block. Um, also, I I feel like it friend feed uh, was large enough at the scale to show you you know how you can if you want to scale a problem with you know uh, solving the NoSQL inside SQL how how you can you do that actually. Um, so again. Uh, using the tool you're comfortable with, read the blog post. Uh, let's quickly move on. Um, as part of that blog post, you won't. I pasted this image here from Wayback Machine because this image is broken there. But essentially, what they claimed was by moving over to the schemaless mechanism and their new architecture, their latencies. You can see on the top graph uh, uh, where he says one week ago, their uh, P99 latencies were down way below well-contained and pretty stable. This is obviously one of the things that developers are always looking for when uh, we're developing these large scale systems. We don't just have to focus on the means, but at the large scales, we have to focus on the P99s or the, the edge cases where the worst cases. So uh, with that in mind, let me quickly show you some schema for how uh, friend free, what a friend feed document. So every time I'm going to show you stuff in JSON format, you can imagine it in whatever format you want, but I would recommend you sticking to JSON. Uh, but I, I'll show you what a document looks like. A document is one object that you can think of uh, that you're dealing with a single entity. So here, here is a post object for friend feed. Um, let me quickly walk through this. Uh, you have fields like ID, user ID, title, link, published and updated. Um, and these are published, updated are like timestamps. So they are like Unix timestamps, numbers. Uh, rest of them are strings, the key value stores that are like strings. Um, what Friendly did was uh, they created a table for entities, for these entities, um, where they have the similar schema, um, except uh, they have this blob in the middle. So for entities, when they're storing it, they're, they're storing this blob in the middle. This is where the whole JSON is going to be dumped as is into the body. So later on, when you're fetching it by ID, um, the ID, the, the, the bodies are going to contain the whole JSON as is, and that can be shipped down the wire. And you know the front end can pick it up and render the feed. So now the question becomes, how can we index? So in the same document, I'm just taking one field as an example here. In the same document, um, you can see there's a user ID field here uh, that I want to index. How can you do that? So uh, FriendFeed created a whole framework around it in order to make sure they can index these kind of fields. You know, So here's how they did the indexing. So they said, OK, so for indexing, create a table for each field. So essentially, what this essentially means that for indexing user ID, they're creating an index table for user ID, where they have a user ID as well, however you might like, a binary key and the entity ID pair in there, and have the background workers populate the newly created index. And then you can also do stuff like, hey, I can do a background write into this table as I'm inserting rows. So essentially what this means is whenever you're inserting a document, there is some additional work that you have to do in order to insert into this table to keep it consistent with the view of the original entity table. So 
uh, I've written the query below. Um, the same example table that they posted in the blog post in index user ID. User ID is the binary entity ID is the reference to the entity ID back into the original table. Uh, primary key is the pair of user ID and the entity ID. Uh, and essentially, whenever you want to say, hey, give me all the rows with user ID X, you just look up this table, you get a bunch of entity IDs and you can do whatever you want from that point onwards. So obviously in order to do that frictionlessly in code, they have to put in a lot of code to make sure whenever you're inserting a row into the table, then you're inserting a row into this table. And when you're ever, you're doing a lookup, you do appropriate uh, reverse lookups. So here is an example uh, of piece of code that I literally picked up uh, from the post again on them describing how they did that. So you can see they, they have the, the whole client side layer has the sense or the knowledge of hey, these are the shards. This is more complex uh, in terms of configuration on the top because it's doing sharding as well, but let, let's even ignore the sharding part. Below, uh, right at the bottom, you can see whenever they're doing a lookup, um, they, the whole lookup mechanism is abstracted away into this language. Um, in their case, it was Python. So it's abstracted away into this Python framework that they created, but essentially, um, the whole responsibility or the load is handed off to the, uh, the creator um, of the table and the index to kind of take care of like, hey, make sure you're doing it on your side. So at store, a key value store, everyone ignored. This is where I'm gonna start. Raise of hands, how many people are like, do a plus one or raise of hands, how many people have actually used at store in past. I, I, see, I see some raised hands here. Awesome. Um, for those uh, who have, have not done it, go check it out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be touching it a little bit on syntax, but uh, I won't go in too much details. So again, at store, uh, you can see it goes back 15 years, 15 years back. Like this, this, this is even before, uh, you know, MongoDB, I think it was 2009 or 2006. I don't know. Uh, I might be messing up dates where they, they actually first got in. But you, you can kind of see how far back this goes. This is almost in the age of axamols and you know soaps and we're transitioning into web 2.0. Um, so let's, let's solve the same problem uh, for, uh, in fact, before solving the same problem, let's, let's just create the same feed. And let's look at how it's gonna look um, from the syntax perspective. So here, here is a simple uh, create table feed uh, with ID, character, and document, it's store, that's it. Uh, for some versions of Postgres, the older versions, you would have to execute the create extension in store command, uh, but that should be more than enough. Uh, once it's configured, then it's done. And that should be it for you know, having a table with um, ID and the document, the schema-free document that you're looking for. So how do I insert or into this row? Pretty simple, insert into feed values, just like anything else that you would do. The random ID and the one at the bottom, ID uh, equal arrow uh, to the value, usability and post equal arrow to hello as at store. And um, that's it. Postgres is actually going to store this as an at store value in there. So some of you might think, oh, so what's the point? Like I stored it, I can fetch it back. Uh, what's the point? Well, the point is you can do uh, complex queries like this now. Uh, so you, what, what I'm doing here is I'm saying select doc, and out of that doc, uh, select the post field as post. And as an example, I selected something undefined as well, undefined field. So just to show you, it would be null uh, from feed where doc ID equals zohability, just to kind of get your feet wet. So essentially, I've already selected a few fields um, from the document store itself and applied a filter on it. And 
this should be the moment of aha for anyone who has not used this before. Um, because you are traversing inside the column into the fields of this document. So, um, however, if I do an explain on it, of course, it would be a sequential scan because there are no indices on it. And just like any good citizen um, of Postgres, you can create an index on it. So this is, this is where uh, I think once you do this, um, the whole problem, the whole framework that FriendFeed built and people did has been solved because essentially you have an index on the field and you can store those documents in there without creating any tables, without creating any triggers or you know, background workers to fill, do the backfills. This whole thing has been done for you out of the box. And of course, you can also say create a synchronous or create index index asynchronously um, to create it in background. While if you discover, oh, I, there's a new field that I need to index. Think about it. If post, uh, if friend feed folks were to do it in uh, MySQL, they they would have to create a whole schema. They would run whole, you know, background scripts to backfill and everything. And just with one, this one statement, you've essentially removed all the engineering overhead and all the maintenance overhead uh, and have a really clean index. Now you can do queries on it and put, you, you can actually run the explain and see it would tell you like it is doing the index scan. But as I said, it doesn't end here. Uh, the whole system is, the whole ecosystem is at your disposal. So when, over here, I'm creating a generalized search uh, index over uh, the whole document. So with gist, um, I, I can just say, okay, create an index on it uh, using gist on the doc column. And now what you can do is something really amazing. Um, you can actually, well, actually you can do it even without this, but then again, there would be linear scans, but I'm, I'm kind of showing you the optimal way of doing it. Um, you can you can do document matching the key value field matching so essentially what i'm saying here is select all the posts and the same undefined field that should be null from feed where document contains another document or the document matches this specification which is another document and over here i'm saying id is zohability so essentially all the documents that contain id zohability they're going to be matched against it and the result set is going to be returned back to you. So let's reimagine FriendFeed, their whole thing, all of that that they did. Um, same entities table. Um, I've just moved over to Postgres data types, updated timestamp, and so on and so forth. The body goes to a store. The user index, the user index that they used to create for mapping everything into a table that becomes a simple, simple background, create con index concurrently on entity ID on this and voila, you're done. You can essentially, um, you, you can essentially look it up by um, the, well, in this case, entity ID, but you can do the same thing with user ID. And there are more operators here. Like uh, what I've showed you is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, here, here is just a snapshot of the operators. Uh, of course, you can do selection with the arrow operator. Um, get, you can get the, you can select multiple fields in single arrow, right? You can concatenate those uh, to its store uh, documents. This is just like a JSON merge if you've done it. Um, the new fields would be added and the previous one would be replaced from the document on the right. Um, and th this, this is extremely useful if you're, doing some kind of updates. So you essentially you can uh, take an existing document, add something new to it and you know, update the document. Uh, the contains key and um, two or third down at arrow is, does the left operand contains right? The one that we use with our gist index and vice versa. Like you can remove fields, you can you know, convert it to an array, delete operands, all that. And again, go go to the link. You 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 will love it. It it lets you almost manipulate all of um, the document 
with these basic operators. But this is where we don't want to stop. You know, um, the next big thing that came in, well, essentially the next big thing that came in initially was uh, JSON data type itself, but it had its own caveats, including uh, it was not parsed, it was not stored really optimized in the, in the, in, on the storage level. So every time you were selecting something out of a JSON document, it would parse the whole document. Um, there, uh, I think I have links to the slide where uh, uh, there were PRs and uh, discussions around uh, supporting nesting of documents inside inside its store. We almost had an it store two at that point in time because people really badly wanted it store two, uh, sorry, uh, nested documents, and it store was just a flat key value store. Um, at that point in time, people thought about, hey, JSON is great. People, it's really well understood standard. People understand it. Why can't we combine the storage uh, optimizations of uh, it store with JSON? And that's where JSON for real deal, JSON B for real deal came in because it was binary serialized and you know all optimized. So again, yeah, coming back from the same story, why JSON? Well understood, go to standard for almost everything on web. It's self-describing in hierarchical form and serialization libraries for every programming languages are out there. You can see Ed store would require each language or driver to support serialization system. Uh, it lets you describe loose shape of object, which might be necessary in some cases. And though some cases, I, I, can, I can throw out some examples, but limit is your imagination, like uh, analytics related workloads where, uh, for example, uh, the, the, the input structure that's coming in, it might have some fields, it might be missing some fields. So you don't need to have that um, sparse table uh, where uh, so many things are known. Similarly, if you're, for example, aggregating things from multiple places where uh, JSON is coming in and you know um, it's totally different for say, Google, coming from Google and totally different say coming from Facebook. So um, you, you, don't, you don't have to bind your table to these uh, scheme, schemas. And um, what, we're gonna, what I'm gonna do is uh, in order to kind of demonstrate uh, how nesting can be useful or how uh, powerful it can be, I'm gonna I'm gonna take example of tweets, um, tweets, and um, hopefully everybody understands Twitter here. Um, so if you look at a Twitter uh, JSON document, it looks something like this. It has an ID, it has some text, it, then it has a user object, and inside user object it has your user information. Then there are nested object called entities, which has you know your tags and all that stuff. We'll, we'll do, some, do some operations on that in some time. And then it has these other timestamps and you know, retweeted, truncated, so on and so forth. So taking the same structure for feed, you can have a similar structure here. And by the way, this is an extreme example, but still like for, for sake of simplicity and keeping it like one to two row, two columns, you can have more columns if you want. The, the fields that you think are always part of structure, you can definitely have them, just like I did it with the ID over here. So I create a tweets table with contents and JSON B column. Now I can insert in a similar fashion where I can say ID is here and the whole string of JSON dumped as is from any anything serialized. I'm, I'm not gonna put an example here, but you can always imagine uh, just doing an insert statement, a basic insert statement that inserts those documents. So now how do I select fields out of it? It looks extremely uh, similar to what you saw in its store. Um, content, uh, the same arrow operator, text, stxt, and then I selected favorite count, scnt. So in this example, I'm just picking you know, uh, text and favorite count. For con from tweets where content id str, id str is ID in string format, and I'm just putting in any ID. And yes, you can index this as well. So essentially you can create an index similar to you did it for um, uh, its store. And that should, be, that should be good enough, right? So you, sh you should be able to do almost whatever you want um, from the structure of the document. 
So picking into structure, if you want to look at the values, uh, there are multiple operators here. Uh, and I'm gonna go with the assumption that, you know, um, you can go to the docs and read about these operators. A lot of these operators look uh, very similar. In fact, they're exactly similar to uh, what you saw in in-store. Uh, so I, I'm just building on the assumption of your knowledge from in-store. Uh, over here, uh, I'm paying out favorite count. I'm selecting all tweets where content favorite count is greater than or equal to one. So again, like I'm picking another field and just saying, trade it as an integer. And if the count is greater than one, select everything over there. But yeah, if I'm gonna explain this without the indexes, you can always imagine it's a sequential scan, which is, which is bad. You should not do that in production. But again, I can create an index on this. So here is an index. It's, it's a very stupid example that I did it on integer or favorite count, but you can, you can almost imagine anything going here. Here's an index. Again, I created an index on saying, hey, content favorite count uh, as an integer, create an index on this. Now, if I select it, you can see it's a bitmap scan and it's, it's optimized as, as, as you expect it's gonna be done from um, Postgres. So now you can imagine the JSON for, for uh, friend feed being stored in here and you doing queries and everything in, in this one basic table and all you need is indices. So, and now you're actually JSON compliant as well. But let's do some more JSON Jitsu, I would say. Uh, so I remember I told you inside um, uh, entities, they're, they're hashtags. So what I want to do is I want to build something uh, that can do a lookup on hashtags. Um, so um, hashtags is usually an array of objects that has a text to the value. It also has some additional information like indices that uh, indicates from what index to start of what index to end of what index. This has been, um, uh, this tag has been applied. So. Python hash Python hashtag Python you it would automatically put that information here but I'm not interested in that that's the beauty of this thing uh, so what I'm what I'm writing now is a little bit more advanced query in terms of uh, what I can select or what I can pull 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 out of this uh, whole document so now what I'm doing is select content hash uh, so this particular operator hash arrow arrow it's gonna it's gonna let me select multiple fields or select paths I can walk paths with this operator. And I'll show you uh, in, in, in an example next on or on the table next, what, what does it mean? So essentially what I'm saying is from content, go walk up to text and select that as a text from tweets where content, inside content, go to entities and then hashtags. So it's essentially saying like, if you were thinking it in JS or JSON, document dot entities dot hashtags right so uh we're 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 selecting all the all the from the array all the documents or all the ob json objects of hashtags and then i'm matching using the same add operator that you saw before uh, that's the beauty of it like the same reuse of the operator uh, match all the documents or match all the array documents that have text python in this and this is gonna return me back all the, all the tweets that have a, a tag of Python in there. So as for JSON operators, there, there are a lot of operators. We've already seen the arrow operator, the arrow with double tip on the top, that's uh, get element as text. The, the, the fancy operator that I showed you, uh, the hash, and the um, angle bracket, that's the one where I was saying, get JSON object in the specified path. If you just do the double uh, angle bracket, it's gonna, it's gonna return you back the object is specified as text. And uh, I, I, I won't recommend using it, but you should be sure about like, hey, in this path, if it's text or something else. Um, similarly, um, exact same operator for matching at this, if the document on the left is the, sub document on the right, the other way around, the field question mark operator for field containing 
Um, similarly, the pipe operators for concatenating negative, so on and so forth. Uh, I'll kind of like this is all documented on the main documentation page of JSON B data type. So you can kind of tinker with it. Uh, really set of, you know, interesting set of operators. And um, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna be able to do quite a lot of stuff just with these operators. So let's, let's do, um, we, we already did selecting text with matching tags, but you know, uh, I didn't call it out before, but um, looking at the same example, I let's let's repeat the example this one more time. Uh, with the hash angle bracket, I'm saying walk inside content go to entities dot hashtags. It's going to return me an array of documents, and then I'm saying if it's a subset of this array document of text to Python, then it's a match, and you're selecting everything. But you can imagine since I don't have any index on this. Uh, this is going to be slow, right? It's going to be a sequential scan. So what if um, I want to create an index? The same greatness uh, surrounds, uh, the same greatness that you had in Edstore surrounds JSONB. Uh, over here, I'm creating that index. Uh, this time I'm creating uh, gen index because I want inverted index in this case. And uh, with JSONB ops, that's the only change that you have to put in there for JSONB operators. So now uh, running, uh, after creating the index, um, I can run more complex queries. So running the older query is gonna be linear or like index scan, uh, but I can do more. I can say, oh, you know what? I, I just observed that a tweet can be a retweet and uh, the hashtags and the parent tweet doesn't have those tags. So I do want to look at the parent, uh, sorry, the retweet itself. And inside there, there are hashtags. I want to surface them as well. Guess what? You don't have to do anything complex at all. Here's, here's an example that I put right on the top. Um, I create an index. Uh, I'm saying inside content, re, look at the retweeted status. And uh, inside the retweeted status, you would see entities and then hashtags and index that as well. So now at the bottom, the query, uh, at the bottom is combining both of them. So what I'm saying is uh, select content from text, uh, the select content text from tweets, uh, where I do a lookup on the entities hashtags of the document. And then I, or with content that's retweet status entities ha hashtag status. So essentially retweeted status dot entities dot, dot hashtags and tags. Uh, also contains the same uh, text. Well, I don't know. I think it's a typo Postgres here, but you can imagine Python there. So essentially, I'm I'm now selecting everything from a nested document, which is the same copy of the parent document. And that's not it. There, there's more to it. That's the that's the beauty of this. So all that we have done so far is just um, you know um, run of the mill features that, that were provided along with these new operators. But now the, the beautiful part of this thing is now you can combine this one B with the whole ecosystem of uh, the Postgres. So you, you, can, you can think of all the features and that's what I'm gonna do. This is, think of this as kind of showing off to other folks on saying, hey, yeah, you can do this as well. So here is an example, um, JSON B and uh, full text searching. So for example, um, I want to do a full text search on the text content itself. So I'm trying to build kind of, I'm kind of digging into, hey, if I'm building a search engine on top of these tweets, this is where I'm heading. So here on the top, you can see I created um, a gin index on the uh, text vectors um, in, for, in English. So the first parameter is English. I'm assuming the tweets are English. Of course they're not, but uh, let's, for sake of simplicity, let's go with this. So pick up the content text and that becomes, uh, that gets converted into the vectors and then I am doing an inverted index on top of it. And there you go. I have a full text search engine. Now I can say select content text where I'm matching TS to vector of, uh, for English text content to query SDR in English and I'm saying Python. So all of search, all of the text that in tweets that contains Python. And I think Python, if you think about Python, it's 
it's more basic, but you can think of more free form text query searches that you can do on top of this. And you have to remember all of this data is sitting inside a column that has been serialized and saved on disk for you in a structure fee format. So all the, all the documents that don't contain the text field would automatically be ignored because they're not. Is that it? I don't think so. Let's let's do one more one more good thing here. So I can use this with partitioning feature of Postgres. So it's it's a new uh, latest and the greatest stuff from Postgres. So what I've done is I've created a table right on the top. I've created a table part tweets just for partition tweets, uh, content JSONB, and then I'm telling it partition by hash of MD5 of content of user ID. So I took a random, well, I just picked content user ID. So inside, uh, remember inside our tweet, we had the user object. So what I'm trying here to do here is I'm trying to partition my documents by user ID. So uh, the, the, for a same user, uh, all the documents of that user lie on the same partition. Uh, it could be anything else for you. Like you can, even partition it by ID or something else, you, whatever you might think of, even from within the document, doesn't matter. This is just an example. Um, and then you can see at the bottom, I have a create table, uh, part tweet zero, one, two, three, uh, uh, and each one of them is a partition of part tweets. Uh, the important thing to remember is the hash and the MD5. And I think anybody who has done basic sharding knows how to do partition with consistent hashing. Uh, over the tables. So um, in, essentially what I'm doing is by doing an MD5, I get a number and I do a hash on top. Like the, by doing MD5 on the user ID, I'm essentially rotating between one of these partitions uh, when the remainder is either zero, one, two, or three. You know, uh, So if uh, your ID is say 10, uh, I do a modulus with four, so the remainder is two. So you're bound to for, for, fall on part tweets to partition. And then I can repeat, rinse and repeat. Now creating same index on the part tweets. Now here's the beautiful part. The tables are partitioned. And now I'm creating an index on the top level table, the same indexes that I created. And I insert into parent table. Don't, I'm not looking into the, the partition tables itself. And with these indices, here's a beautiful part. Now I do a query on part tweets. And you can see when I did the query on uh, tweets for saying, hey, pull out everything that has Postgres tags on it. You, you can see it automatically distributed, Postgres automatically distributed it among the tables doing bitmap scan and then you know pending the results together. And doing it on even more complex queries, you can see it still does a pretty, pretty optimized version of bitmap or, and then bitmap indexing on each one of them for each of the lookups that you did. And the whole thing has been solved for you without, this is all without writing any client side code. This is all done for you just because the ecosystem of JSONB and partition indexing is working hand in hand. So the limit is your imagination, you know, uh, don't underestimate the power of you know, your tools, the something that you understand, um, Postgres and the schema free storage. I, I know um, people, there, there, there is still a tendency to say, oh yeah, this new tool is hip. But if you just look at uh, the feature sets that have been shipped in Postgres, I think they're pretty awesome. For links and resources, uh, I, I'm attaching a bunch of links here, including my blog posts and uh, some really important uh, uh, documentation slides and uh, presentations uh, around the topic. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, I would like to open up the floor for questions. Got to say that was a pretty fun presentation. Um, so far, we only have one question. So go ahead and get those in now. Um, so the first question came in only a few moments ago, and uh, it was why the MD5 part for the partition key? Why MD5 for, oh, okay. So it's totally up to you. It's not required as such. You, 
MD5, um, what it, uh, what I would say is if your user ID generation is not sequential, then you won't need to probably worry about it. But, but with what MD5 does is I took a very basic hash function that, that kind of does an even distribution. So passing it through the MD5 function is gonna make your documents spread more evenly across the, 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 the partitions that you have. You don't necessarily need to do it because if the user ID is already an integer, yes, the mod would work. But you can imagine when it's sequential, uh, then first uh, uh, partitions, you know, uh, there, there's going to be there's going to be a skew of partitioning. MD5 makes it kind of more even, and it's totally up to you. Uh, it's totally dependent upon uh, the ID generation mechanism. Wonderful. Um, sort of follow up to that. Um, does partition by hash expect a value from a hash function such as MD5? Because that would explain it. Yeah. So uh, essentially, what hash function? When you're, uh, when I was doing, uh, if you remember at the bottom, um, I was doing a modulo with four, right? So imagine. Okay, let me make it even more simple. Imagine if your field is not integer or a number. Imagine it's a string, right? So user ID. Imagine if it's a UUID, and I think in case of Twitter, it is a number, but you can imagine if it's a UUID that you have generated. So yeah, then um, the, 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 the modulo partitioning mechanism where I'm specifying the criteria of what goes in this table actually requires that to be something that is ingestible. So it's totally, it's totally dependent upon the scenario. Don't, don't take that seriously. Thank you. Um, how is benchmark comparison on performance of Postgres JSON with Mongo excluding sharding options? Yeah, um, I, I've I've not seen official third-party benchmarks, but uh, one of the slices, uh, one of the slides that I've included in the links, uh, it has some benchmarks uh, with its store, um, and uh, its store did beat it. Uh, so uh, it, it was faster, but this still needs to be verified from third party. The problem with, I think what everybody forgets when they're comparing MongoDB and Postgres is, uh, Postgres is like solid asset store. Like it's it's a full transactional asset store. It's not like any random, you know, dump it out. I know uh, Mongo has made, made improvements, uh, but uh, I would recommend if you ever pick Mongo, first go look at the Jasmine benchmarks, if that rings a bell. Um, but even with that, the benchmarks are, I don't think they're comparable to be honest, uh, from asset perspective and all the transactional perspectives, but even with all of that, the, the individual benchmarks show a higher score, but, um, I, I won't take them seriously if it's good enough. And if it scales enough, good enough, I, I would take that any day. Fantastic. Um, you've gotten a bunch of thank yous. How is opinion on OLTP and OLAP? Um, can we grow with the same, grow with the same Postgres with 25 plus terabytes? Yeah, uh, I, I know there are various, okay. So when people usually are talking about these kind of workloads, I know there are flavors of Postgres that are optimized for, optimized for like OLTP and, you know, analytics workloads and all that. Um, I've personally seen Postgres work at a pretty, like, of course I cannot disclose the numbers, but a pretty large scale, like more, more than what I thought Postgres can do. So yes, yeah, I think it from the whole thing that you have to remember is the foundational pieces remain exactly the same when you're looking up the columns and when you're doing these lookups, it's as good as uh, when you had an index on a column and you were doing a lookup. Right, so the foundational pieces remain the same. So if something was working on that particular index, it should work here as well. It, it is no different than a regular index that you've seen. Okay, so with that, we can actually call it. Um, thank you so, so, so much. Uh, this was a wonderful presentation. I have to say, I loved the font. We had a lot of fun with that. Um, and for all of our attendees, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for spending a little bit of your day with us. 
Um, and I hope to see you on future Postgres conference webinars. Have a great rest of your day, whether it's morning or evening. Thank you. See ya.